This is Capsule on LiveInLimbo.com. My name is Sean Chin. And I am Andreas Babilakis. This is Adventure into Film, Pulp Culture, and, again with this episode, Especially Music. Why Especially Music? Because, Andreas, you wrote killer lists of the top songs of the decade so far. So this is from, what, 2010 until, I guess, now 2015. Well, 2014, because it was... uh, those five years right and uh thank you for the compliments but i believe in these cases because i have a list for both songs and for albums and i will have for um acting performances and films uh for the next two weeks i believe they're killer because of the actual selections themselves and it's interesting because um i remember when we did our recap sarah ricks was going into how um, 2014 needed a room for improvement. And I do agree in a sense. I think it was a pretty good year. But if you look at everything in a retrospect... Um, She's really hard to impress as well. <laughs> no, but I do think she has a point where um, I'm looking at these lists as a whole and I think, okay, I have very few from 2014 on either of these. Now, for films and performances, it might be different. But for the music-related... Yeah, I believe that is the case. However, combined, all of these five years combined, regardless of how strong or weak the years were, I went into how strong 2010 was on that podcast, and I still feel just as such. Um, but collectively, oh my goodness, it's actually been a very good five years, and I hope everyone feels the same way about it. Well, I hope that within a five-year span, there would be some really top-notch stuff. That would be pretty sad if there wasn't. Well, we go into um, the the slacking of the music industry. We go into how tired a lot of it's feeling. And it's, it's good to see that when you piece them all together, it's like There's some albums. <laughs> yeah, they're like some albums where you think, okay, this is going to be in the top 10. And they're not even close. That's just how good it's been. I mean, I have... Two notable entries for my albums list where one of them was in my top 10 initially as I did more work. I mean, I've been working months on these, compiling them, making like a long list and a short list, um, balancing them out, figuring out which album was better from which artist. Because as we've talked about before, I don't like to duplicate artists. Um, So one album ended up being like 18th when it was in my top 10 initially. And one didn't even make the, the cut at all. And it was in my top 10. So, well... Let's That's get the competition. <laughs> let's get to the top twenty-five songs of the decade so far. So we're gonna just um, list off the first, what, the top twenty, and then we'll. Well, gonna... we can list off all of them until the top ten, and we can actually go into the top ten with discussion. All right, so take us there. Okay, so we'll start off with songs. Um, my twenty-five songs of the decade so far so number 25 is uh santa gold's disparate youth from 2012 oh yes uh just give them some context i actually don't have um the years in front okay i will provide you the years then yes that's your contribution (laughs) um uh santa gold is very fun and poppy uh kind of varies outside of the genre a bit give her a shot number 24 is sludge metal band kylisa's tired climb which came out 2010 i believe yes that is correct ah good guess um <laughs> number 23 is yeah yeah yes poppy rolling stones-esque song sacrilege which came out 2013 i believe yep number 22 came from last year so 2014 it's the bruce springsteen-esque song red eyes by the war on drugs one of my favorite tracks of last it year. is a yeah. great song yeah Number 24, or uh, 21. Oh, uh, have you, you've seen them perform that live, right? Red Eyes. I did, and that was something truly special. That That is a song that can take many forms in many listening settings, live, on album. It's It was just one of the stronger songs of 2014, for sure, and many publications agreed with that, actually. Um, I won't botch it up this time. Number 21 <laughs> is uh, Gang Gang Dance, fe- featuring Alexis Taylor of Hot Chip. Um, the song Romance Layers, which is very retro in sound, very cultural in style, and it's it's just great. It's 2011, I believe, yeah, right? 2011. The next one's also from 2011. Yep. Girls uh, Vomit. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, which sounds repulsive, but I, I can guarantee it's actually a very moving um, 
kind of depressing song about uh, somebody longing for love and not achieving it. So um, give that a listen. And um, on the contrary, we have uh, Lana Del Rey's video games, which is more about finding love in very basic places. That's also it's- from 2011. So three 2011s in a row. Ooh. I believe this next one is 2010, right? Yeah. Which is Kavinsky's Night Call. If you're into um, synth pop or Daft Punk, French House, if you saw the movie Drive and the song at the beginning, well, this is the song at the beginning. If that tickles your fancy, listen to it outside of the movie because it's very strong in its own. It's it's just a terrific track, and I'm glad that it's getting noticed even before the movie came out. Um Number 17, speaking of uh, notice that that is well-deserved, is Janelle Monae's um, Come Alive, The War of the Roses, which I feel is her strongest vocal track. And give it a listen. It's like Stray Cats meets punk meets demonic vocals. And that came out 2010, right? Yep. Cool. Uh, So far, my guesses have been pretty good. Yeah, well, you wrote the list, so... (laughs) Well, I haven't written the the dates down, though. Uh, Number 16 is PJ Harvey, The Glorious Land, 2011. A lot of stuff came from 2011. That was a pretty strong year, 2011 into 2010. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, this is no different because, well, PJ Harvey's always been a top-class act, and uh, The Glorious Land is just a very great track. I remember when uh, Let England Shake came out and... Um, I listened to it. I thought it was pretty good at first. You'll see how I feel about it on the next list. Um, I thought it was pretty good at first, but I didn't see truly how good it was until later on. But this song was undeniably... There was something undeniably terrific about it, and I hope you feel the same way. And speaking of um, older musicians who just know how to have a knack for truly finding something special in music, we have... James Murphy with his project LCD Sound System, Dance Yourself Clean, 2010, I believe, yep. number 15. And this is a great slow burning disco track that truly makes you appreciate all the things you have to work for in life. That's how I feel like. Anyways, um, another lengthier track is number 14 with Kendrick Lamar's double hit, Sing About Me, I'm Dying of Thirst. And that came out 2012. 12, yeah. 12, I believe. It's a very, yep, it's a very narrative uh, hip-hop song about re-evaluating life, religion, finding out about mortality, that no one's invincible despite how young you are and how upcoming your career is. It's, it's scary, but it's optimistic in, the, in its fears. Um, number 13 is Caribou's Can't Do Without You, which came out last year as well. And it's a very catchy and emotional song, like... It's there's not much to say about it because it's it speaks for itself. It's very emotive, and it it's moving. And if you don't feel that way, you you're you're cold. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. all I have to say about yeah, that. Yeah, I agree <laughs> with you. Yeah. Number twelve um, is Animal Collective, New Town Burnout, two thousand twelve. Yes, and said to beat Hertz, which was seen as a disappointment. Um, I I kind of agree. I I thought it was incredible at first listen. It didn't kind of age as well, but this song never moved with how I felt about it. It's, it's got a very interesting atmosphere to it, and I hope you feel the same way. Uh, almost in our top 10, we have number 11 with Grimes Be a Body, which I think is a very nice deconstruction of what pop music can be. That's and not what it's, it's called. Very, you have to say the full name. I don't know how to pronounce that Japanese characters. Is that Japanese? <laughs> I think that looks Chinese. Is it Chinese? I thought it was Japanese. It doesn't look Japanese. I don't know. We could I thought it was a, a Japanese. Um, well, I'm going to look this up right now. We're not really on the air. We're recording this, but for argument's sake, we're on the air. So be a body. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, but I'm pretty sure it's from a Japanese ideology. Um, the Japanese title of the song refers to... Let's let's pull this up because I'm right. They must have a I'm pronunciation. Rev- <laughs> I don't think so. This is on uh, Genius. Um Where's where's that explanation? I, I was just reading it um, about what's, the Japanese title of the song refers to the Japanese concept of wabi sabi. Uh, I, I think that's how you pronounce it, maybe. Um, which represents a Japanese worldview that beauty is in, is impermanent, which really plays into the song because of how um, 
inconsistent it is. That's a word, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, just making sure. Um, of just how inconsistent it is, you can edit that out. Um, it's it's inconsistent. I'm Let's trying to figure on. out how you pronounce it, but I can't. So okay, let's get into the top ten. Wabi well, sabi. That's that, that. That's about okay. it. Okay. So, before we embarrass ourselves. <laughs> Number ten, we have have Tame Impala's It Feels Like We Only Go Backwards. 2012, uh, yeah. yeah. 2012. Um, I think I wrote down the wrong name here. What is it, actually, on the one that I gave you? Feels Like We Only Go Backwards. Close enough. Uh, <laughs> feels Like We Only Go back Backwards, yes. Okay, well, first of all, let's see what you think think with these top 10 before i go into it what do you think of this song well i think these top 10 are like really strong solid tracks i like pretty much all of them i think you picked a good 10 to represent the last uh dec half of a decade um well i'll let you start off with this one because this one's probably my least favorite one uh this is your least favorite yes of the top 10 well that's why it's your 10 but okay uh what what do you dislike about it then well i guess like tame impala is a really great band i like the energy that they bring live this track is i don't know like you even say it's kind of uh it's a dazzling one it's like very beatlesque right uh well yeah it sounds well a lot of tame impala especially and these comparisons have made have been made before um a lot of it sounds like the studio era of the Beatles, which that's not I saw it really it's not uh, a bad an insult it's not thing. a bad thing, but for me I kind of like I'm towards a more modern solid kind of song. Theirs is like very traditional rockish. Well, well to me it bands who do this kind of thing, and trust me, Tim and Paul is not the only one, bands who do this kind of thing are only expanding on the studio qualities that the Beatles would have invested their time in if they had made music now. And to me, that's special because they're carrying on this Abbey Road studio um, tradition of trying to excel with your production yeah. and seeing truly how far traditional pop music can go. And I, I like that notion, especially because here it works really well. Well, and especially on all of Inner Speaker and uh, Lonerism, both of those albums, uh, they truly go above and beyond um, what you could do in a studio, and that's part of their charm. Yeah. So to me, it's a good thing. It is. It is. I like the song, but it's not my favorite. <laughs> Number nine, though, Brian Eno. Got it right there. No, you did. It's oh, my Eno. God. <laughs> Number nine, Brian Eno and Carl the Hyde. With, in a row. with <laughs> Return... Uh, number nine with Brian Eno and Carl Hyde uh, return last year. I really like this track. Actually, you brought this to my attention. And I like, it's a long song, like longer than like your radio kind of song. But the instrumentals and the way it progresses along with the vo vocals is very, very good. And I think you named it number one from last year. Oh, absolutely. It was my number one last Last year, I remember um, when I first came out with it, and I said, I think this is going to be my number one. And I remember throughout uh, last year, it, a lot of songs bounced off number one. I, and I remember I wasn't listening to the song too often, but when I started to listen to it again and truly take in how it felt, I remember, you know, songs like Can't Do Without You and Red Eyes are terrific, absolutely. But they are good because you know what to expect with them, and you, you say, I want to hear the ending to red eyes again because it's just so triumphant and i remember with this song it just felt it felt like i was listening to it for the first time again like like that that dawning of emotions that i got from the first listen i hear it every single time with this song and that's ultimately what made it um my top song of last year and i like how repetitive carl hyde's um guitar riffs are but at the same time because they're bouncing off with so many ideas being presented in the song they sound different and the song never sounds monotonous and that's the beauty of uh, Brian Eno's song writing and, and production work and Carl Hyde's attention to um, instrumentation and what minimalism can be added to the song. Actually, Eno is about minimalism, minimalism as well, if I can say that right. Uh, they should shorten that word really because that's what it's about. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, no, it's it's a terrific song, and I think you f you'll find something new with it every time you listen to it. I feel the same. It's very refreshing every time you listen to it. Number eight is Kanye West. 
devil in a new dress that kind of rhymes 2010 yeah uh it was difficult to find which song i think was kanye west's best that also rhymes um on uh on his album my beautiful dark twisted fantasy or even ease this uh, because that was a terrific album as well but it's hard because there are just so many new ideas and uh Challenges that he succeeded with, with both albums, and I mean, um, you can say Runaway, like his probably his greatest single of the last five years, um, New Slaves was terrific as well, um, even Power, which again was also a radio hit, but even if you stray away from radio hits, you have Hell of a Life, which uh, was a very robotic, but um, anthemic kind of track, you just had so many options and i think this one won because it's one of his closest to his old style but at the same time you're not getting the college dropout with this song you're getting my beautiful dark twisted fantasy it just sounds like his old production value and it shows it doesn't show a maturity as much as it shows him being in a new place and before you would have had these gospel samples for him representing religion and and uh, the choir that backed him up right uh, you know jesus walks for instance but with this song you know he's saying you could find a lot through the devil himself and through sin and even though it's still very gospel-esque in sound and it's got the retro r&b motown vibe to it it doesn't sound like a throwback it doesn't sound innocent and at all it just it sounds kind of eerie which i think was really interesting and you have rick ross's contribution you have the guitar solo just spice things up it's it's old Kanye west but it's still very different and it's not in a way where to say oh he's better now it's in a way that he feels almost possessed and he feels sick and that's kind of what interesting about the entire album as a whole because he's acknowledging that fame has made him sick and fame has changed his life and it's it's a double-edged sword it's as rewarding as it is um damning and you'll find that a lot in this song where it's old kanye west but it's not the same man yeah number seven is ariel pink's haunted graffiti round and round 2010 i like the song but i wish you picked one from last year <laughs> Well, nothing was good. White Freckles, I love the that song. Brian Eno and Carl Hyde. Yeah. No, White Freckles is a great song, absolutely. But I think this is their best. And uh, a lot of publications would agree because White Freckles is catchy. There's no doubt about it. But then again, many Ariel Pink songs are very catchy. And Round and Round is special. That's the difference with it. Well, round and Round, it doesn't make sense on the first listen. I remember when Pitchfork declared it the best song of the year and i listened to it thinking oh how could this be um how could this be run away that came in second like that doesn't make any sense and i put it on and i think this this i i don't i don't even get what this is is this trying to be the 80s i didn't get it and the more you listen to it and the more it's pieced together you know because the chorus doesn't even make a presence until well into the middle of the song um you have all these different ideas bouncing off at once but they're not clearly separated. They kind of merge into one another. Um, so there's not a lot of distinction within the song. That's kind of what's interesting about it. Once you kind of get what it's about, it's truly mystifying. And it's it's very charged in emotion. And I just get a rush with it every time I, I listen to it. I don't know how you feel about it. Yep, I do as well. But number six is one that I really like. This is taking it back all the way to the beginning of the decade to uh, Crystal Castle's I Am Made of Chalk, 2010. So now I really miss these guys. They broke up. But like this song, I actually would, probably would have chosen another song, but I really like this song. Like they have a lot of good songs. If you had to choose one from the band, like as you do, this would be a very good contender. And I agree with you. Well, it's the one that I chose for my uh, best of Crystal Castle's list. And um I said it would be one of the best of the decade, and I wasn't lying. Um, now, because you're heavily into Crystal Castles, I mean, they kind of are our theme, for God's sakes. Um, That's true. Yeah, they are. Like, how, what song would you pick as their best, and how do you feel about such an artistic and 
kind of experimental song of theirs being placed so high on a list like this, actually. So, you know, the funny thing is that the type of music they do, I think it's like, what, electronic thrash metal, something like that, is not something I normally listen to. I'm sure there's other bands like that, but for some reason, their music really translates to me. I get it for some reason. I don't know exactly why. The first time I heard them, um, the sounds from Untrust Us was like, she wasn't uh. speaking English there. It was like jarbled, but I could get the emotion and the the melodies and the sounds from it. And then from there, I dove into it and I heard Crime Wave and then um, Magic Spells, Courtship Dating, and all these, oh, and um, one of... Black Panther, that was a great one too, and Reckless. So, I don't know, like these sounds really got to me. So, if I were to choose one that I really, really loved of them, I would actually go with like either Baptism. I think Baptiz- Baptism is my favorite Crystal C- Castle song. Okay, for like the decade you mean so far then? Yeah. No, okay, I, don't think cool. that would, I don't think that would be in your decade though. Let's see when that one came out. <laughs> <laughs> no that is that's the same album as i made a chalk yes that's right 2010 yeah right there so i would choose uh baptism yeah so celestica was also, oh, I, also very yeah. good yeah uh, you know you could go with many things with them and uh of course not in love but like that's kind of um controversial because the main version like the most popular version she's not she's barely in it well yeah she's on the album version anyways yeah. um but yeah, like such an artistic song when they have all these pop songs as you as you just described. Uh, do you think it's odd for it to play so highly on a list? No, I, because I think if they, if this band of this genre and style can interest me, someone who does does not listen to it normally, that says a lot about them. Yeah, uh, and I think it's. I think it's a very abstract song, but it's got a purpose, and it has all these urban legends about what it's about. Like, in my review, I discussed the possible story of the mother drowning her child, which was a very sad story that hit the news in Toronto around the time that the song came out. And um, it it could mean a lot of things, but I, I definitely hear that story in it, because you could hear the sound clips that relate to this, to this this uh, to, to the synopsis of this news piece very eerily and whatever it means it's it's fully charged with all sorts of angst and depression and i think it speaks very little but it speaks volumes and i think i still think it's their strongest track yeah so yeah i agree um speaking of metal which i don't know if i would ever classify crystal castles as metal even though they are very punky in nature um speaking of metal though we have uh, number fives all say with a per se de lumiere which i probably we mispronounced because I did not do well in French, <laughs> which came out 2010, I believe. Yep. Yep. And um, you've given this one a listen as well. I did. I, I actually, so I compared this one with what was the one that you named for last year for the top. Oh, Deliverance. Yeah. So, okay. Those are like very different. Yeah. Because <laughs> last year's Shelter, they went solely post rock and shoegaze I and think there I, wasn't I, an ounce I, of screaming. Yeah, I really liked that style versus the two thousand ten style. <laughs> yeah, you're not a fan of this song? Then? No. I am not. So but you still dislike Tame and Paula's song more than this one. Yes. No, I would I would say I'd like Tame and Paula more than this one. <laughs> okay, so you were wrong about what you said before. <laughs> Okay, so what do you dislike about this song? Because I think... No, well, I think I only dislike it. Hello? Yeah, I think I dislike this one only because I heard their new stuff first. But you can't dislike a band's old style just because you prefer the new style. I know, I just... Do you like this one at all? I I like it. I agree that it's a, a good song. It's just not for me again. Like, I would... Why didn't you choose the one from last year? (laughs) <laughs> well, I, I'll go into that. Um, Why is this one better than their new style? I'll say have well, if you like that style, um, their album before Shelter, you might like a lot actually. 
there's a lot of metal on it as well, but uh, it's closer to Shelter's style. And um, I chose this one because there are a lot of Alsace songs that are moving. They're, they're just so beautiful despite their aggression. And this one always stuck with me, I remember, because of all the different movements within the song. It's one of their most aggressive sounding period and um, I don't like even then it's songs. still very graceful you don't like what aggressive songs not like, even deaf heaven no well, see deaf heaven's different because are they though because they've got similar goals in mind both bands yeah you know yeah i know i don't yeah <laughs> they're very different still but well with this song i like the way that the song was pieced together it kind of uh, starts off with the riff and it ends off with it as if it encloses itself within a circle you experience so many different ideas and notions um, it doesn't feel like the song climaxes it feels like the entire song is one climax that just kind of goes around in, an, in a Euroboros kind of fashion, it just never ends it eats its own tail and continues and you find so many different takes on uh, on these emotions whether it be through the screaming or whether it be through the triumphant midsection or through the very resonating um, echoing guitar reverb that kind of isolates itself there's just so many things that play on this one idea of of um of trying to capture this feeling and i think it's just a rush every time i listen to it and it just it sticks out so well as a metal track so that's that's my give and take on yeah, it. Well, that's good. Um, number four is the song that I <laughs> I I don't really you don't like. like this either. I don't like the sound of it, and I also don't like it because it's not on RDO and I can't share it. Uh, this is my bloody Valentine Wonder Two from 2013, which topped my when I started doing these lists for Live in Limbo. It topped my list for 2013, and. I've got to say, I think this song is spectacular, and I know a lot of people it's want to agree, loud. but a lot of it people do make agree. Sense. Well, you don't listen to the band, though, do you? Yeah, you I listen do. to My Bloody Valentine? Yeah, a little, but like, they're not my favorite, but like, this song, to be ranked so high is kind of weird. Well, to me, it makes a lot of sense, because to me, this is one of those songs Songs that when you hear it the first time, you'll never experience that ever again. Like with Return, uh, Brian Eno and Carl Hyde, I said that you kind of experience it the first yeah. time every time you listen to it. With this, you kind of do, but you don't. You'll never truly feel that sense of wonder. Well, no pun intended, actually. Um, You'll never sense that initial curiosity as to where is this going i don't understand what i'm listening to i am lost but i like what i'm hearing well i don't know if you did but um but i like what i'm hearing and every time you listen to it again it's you try to achieve that again and it's kind of that rush and that chase to feel that initial reaction all over again and and there's so much going on like just so many layers upon layers and while my blood Valentine's no stranger to um, creating walls of sound and layering, but with this, it's their ultimate test as to how far this can go so far, because they've never really used such whirlwinds of sound before. Like, yes, they've had swirling guitars and noise, but with this, you have the drums set so far to the back, and even the drums are pretty um, chaotic. They're, they're jungle, uh, the jungle drumming, and, and um, just everything is is cloaked within sound and the more like like the more the song continues the more sounds are piled upon each other and you don't think it's going to end and it doesn't and i remember seeing the song live when they came to the cool house in 2013 it was it was one of the best songs live i've ever seen it i don't know you either get the song or you don't and i'm not yeah, saying i don't get it <laughs> i'm not saying uh, oh you should should if if you don't i i just don't think it's for everyone because i think for some people it's just noise but for others it's it's you're you're encased in smog and you don't want to you don't want to be separated from it you either do or you don't yeah. you know number number three so. on the list is chromatics into the black from 2012 so i like this song and obviously you like the song if it's your top three but 
it's interesting because I like it because the melody is there and it's like a progression. And then as you said, it, it it's reserved enough that it doesn't blow out into full force. So it's like you, you feel it and they just keep it right before the orgasm. Have you heard the original by Neil Young? No. I think you'll appreciate the song a little more if you do, because if you hear the original, uh, well, there's two. There's um, Into the Black and Out of the Blue. They're called Hey, Hey, My, My, and My, My, Hey, Hey. Um, they're kind of an answer on a call. One of them's acoustic. One of them's kind of like a jam. Uh, either way, they feel a lot more personal for Neil Young. You know, it's like his take on, on the rock world, uh, his place in it even. Um, it'll never die. With chromatics, it sounds like it's already died, and they're looking at the rebel from after the apocalypse. Nothing exists anymore. It's like this notion that rock will never die. They're clinging on to it. But it's so frigid and cold, and, you know, it's already happened. But they can't let go of that mentality, because Neil Young, one of the greats, said it would never die. And they're trying their best to keep it alive. And, you know, with such a... Re- Retro sounding band, it makes more sense as to why they're, they're clinging onto this limp's corpse. Now, I'm not somebody who thinks that Rock is dead. I'm not Gene Simmons, but um, that's how it feels with this because it's definitely being challenged nowadays. Where it's barely being featured on the radio, um, it's barely it's barely being acknowledged by the masses. It's more it's more segregated into. Um, its own culture now, which it's following the the route of, of metal. Not to say the rock never had a culture before. Of course it did, but you know it used to be a it used to be a bit of a um, a bit unified with with pop and with hip hop. You know, like you listen to it on Kiss ninety two, you won't find rock on there anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, whereas back in the day, Linkin Park, who you know they're a rock band, they would would be on KISS 92. Some 41 would be on KISS 92. Not, not anymore. You're not going to find it anymore. They were and, on KISS 92? I never knew that. Oh, absolutely they were. I, I barely listened to were. the radio. That's pretty weird. If they did that Well, you, you're smarter than I was. Uh, uh, they're not going to be on, the, on that station now, though, no. And even rock stations now are veering towards indie, which is popular sounding, or they're veering towards older stuff. Like, yeah, we have rock. We have um, Red Hot Chili. Chili Peppers and Green Day, that's Q107, because they went from classic rock to just straight-up rock now. Yeah. (laughs) Hey, what? Green Day. What do you... Oh, (laughs) well, that's the thing. Like, that's what they're advertising. And it's like, hang on, hang on a second. What about newer stuff? You know, what what about, you know... Okay, well, apparently you're still gunning for old stuff then. Okay, cool. They should Um, be playing bands like number two, which is Beach House's Wishes. Yes, Beach house need more attention and well within within the groups that we would hang out with sean they've gotten massive amounts of attention believe me and you saw them live yes and they were well not they were they they still are in my top five best shows i've ever been to that absolutely sublime experience and um yeah within our circles they're massive i mean they've been featured for trailers for uh movies like uh, blue is the warmest color um They've caught the attention of people like Beyonce and Jay-Z who have been at their shows. Um, so they've gotten a bit of the mainstream appeal. But with our circles, you know, they've been revealed as like indie gods for a while now. You know, they have four albums which are spectacular. And um, this was really difficult. With this band, I actually wrote two full um, reviews because... For the longest time, I was fighting between Wishes and 10 Mile Stereo, which I think is an extremely close second to being the best song. And for years, because uh, 10 Mile Stereo came out in 2010, um, for years, 10 Mile Stereo was their best. Like, nothing could compete. It was just such a beautiful song. And yeah, I listened to Bloom, which came out in 2012. I listened to Bloom. I got what it was all about. Um, But I was so fixated on Teen Dream that I don't know if I fully appreciated Bloom until uh, after 2012, because I think it's a phenomenal album now. And this song especially only popped out uh, within the years after Bloom got released. And I slowly realized that it kind of um, it progressed a lot in a way a Brian Eno song would. I think I compared it to Here Comes the Warm Jets. Uh, um, 
which they're very different songs entirely but the way that the instruments kind of pile on top of one another and it's so fluid and so so small in progression but so impactful at the same time that's that's what wishes is it, it's kind of like a it is a wish in itself that it's getting stronger the more the narrator is hopeful yeah and um i don't know what's your favorite beach house song because i know you're into them too no i like i would say this one as well uh wishes i like this one the best i was thinking I had the same comparison. I did the same comparison that you did, kind of, but I think Wishes still wins out. Well, you were with uh, Time Mouse Stereo as well? Yeah. Oh, oh interesting then. Okay, because we did, didn't talk about this beforehand, so that was pure coincidence then. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about a lot on the podcast, actually, when we first started, right? Yeah, that was episode two. I think. And yes. Yeah, I remember when uh, Wonder 2 topped my 2013 list. I remember. A week or two later, um, a certain EP dropped, and it dropped without any announcement. And I remember when I messaged you, I said, I wish this song came out earlier because it's strong <laughs> enough to have been really high on my list. Now, two years later, um, I didn't know it would have been this high. I mean, it, it ended up dethroning Wonder 2 for me, sadly, because I, I, I adore that song. But, Which is good, because um, I don't like that one. <laughs> come on. But this song is not just the best of that year. I, I think it's the best of the decade so far, and strongly so. It's Burial's very moving, very long, but very engaging song, Come Down to Us. Yep, from 2013, as you said. Um, so this one's interesting because this is not something that you'll hear on the radio. This is probably not a commercial favorite at all, but it's pretty much like three songs in one that all flow together well and it's very emotional and it brings you up and down yeah because the first song or the first move let's say is um it's kind of old burial in sound except it's you know old, old burial was very um it was very cold on purpose it kind of made you feel isolated but the more mature his music got the more it tried to embrace you instead especially this track which um is clearly uh dedicated to those who are bullied especially those who are um who uh, are experimenting in transgender um in the transgender movement or lgbt in any aspect of it and uh, we'll get to that in a bit and um, it's old burial, but it's embracing. So it's kind of like his EP work from up until this point, and not so much untrue, right? And then the second movement uh, is very rival dealer in sound, which is the EP that this came off of. Um, it's got the the very um, the very epic kind of rhythm to it, and it's a lot more open than burial usually is. Rival dealer just felt very open in sound, which is very unusual usual for him because again he sounds very closed and introverted most of the time and the last movement um it's it's the shortest it's kind of a song but it's more of like it almost feels like a spoken word even though it's not uh burial himself speaking it's um lana wachowski the famous director who um her and her brother worked on the matrix v for vendetta well they didn't direct v for vendetta i think they only produced it i believe um called atlas though they were worked on and she was publicly known as the first filmmaker to come out as transgender. And she had a massive 30-minute speech on the matter at hand and how she came about um, coming out, how it affected her career, and parts of it were included in Burial Song. Now, a lot of people have noted this, and I think it's interesting because before he would splice samples into obscurity, like... Um, on the song Untrue, he made Beyonce sound like a male, which I think is very... It's it's a nice, ironic twist because, well, the song is about deception and lying. So I said, aha, there we go. That That's a very clear, clever sample. But it's, un it's unusual for him to make it a very known... Like an obvious thing. ...source as to where he got his samples. Yeah, and with this, it's mostly unedited, even though there were different parts of the speech uh, put together. Um... Each segment of the, of the, of her talking is unedited, and you could tell that it's her. You could tell what she's speaking about, and it's got Burial's typical crackle behind her, and um, it just wraps everything up to a close. Where um, the song can mean anything to you, but for once, 
he's explained what it means to him. And he did that with uh, Lana Wachowski at the end. So what does it mean to you? No, it means, I don't know, like, it doesn't, when, for this song or most songs in general, when, when you say, when someone asks, does it mean something to you? I don't think it, they mean so much for me because I didn't, like, make the song, but I feel it. I feel, yeah, like, I just feel it, like, resonate. Like, the whole, I resonate with the sounds of a song more than the lyrics, sometimes the lyrics, but, like, for Burial, he's a very, inst- well, he is instrumental, right? So it's like, and he adds in blips and samples of other people singing. He's not the one singing, but I feel his sounds. The sounds yeah. is what talks to me. And the same can yeah, be said for Crystal Castles as well. Well, it's it's noteworthy with Burial because with Crystal Castles, they're still they still, they're still um are singing vocal. Stuff, yeah, she's right. still singing, and with, kind of like Cigarros do too. They're singing, but the vocals are more of an instrument along yeah. with the other instruments. With Burial, though, what William Bevan does, who is Burial, of course, what William Bevan does is. Uh, well, especially on Rival Dealer, where he's trying to actually convey a point across solely um, for that reason, and not to create an abstract as he usually did. Um, he actually pieced together sentences, like especially in Come Down to Us, he's, he pieced together sentences which sound so spliced and um, like they don't really mesh, but at the same time they're speaking, they're speaking full, complete, coherent sentences, and. Um, it's kind of like I like that a lot because it's not his way of uh, of saying, "Look, look at my mastery. I can make this sound like it's effortless and it's it's one thing you couldn't even tell it was spliced together." I like that it was sh- like mashed together because it's the different voices telling this person that they're going to be okay. Um, it's these fighting ideas trying to overcome the negativity of the world. Uh, there's just so much interesting context. Yeah, well, it's like when like the Joker or an evil bad guy in a movie or a comic they take the each letter from like a different newspaper or magazine and they build it into a sentence. So Burial does that, but with a positive message instead of a negative one. That's an interesting note because it's kind of like a letter to the world and they can't write anything for themselves because they're too scared of what the world might think. So perhaps they use what the world said to them and piece it together kind of like a ransom letter with an, with an autumn, uh, anonymity. Yeah, that's the word. Yeah. Or like <laughs> Bumble- anonymity there. Or like Bumblebee from Transformers, where he takes different uh, words from different radio stations and forms it into a sentence. Which I wish we would. I wish we never ever compared Transformers <laughs> with Burial <laughs> okay. ever again, please. <laughs> okay. like different ends of the spectrum. Yeah, there I now. know, but it's <laughs> yeah. Okay, I get what you. I get. But it. yeah, <laughs> Burial. If, Burial. We talk about him a lot on the show. Is incredible. I mean, this is the uh, this is the album or the ep rather that he um showed his face to the world and actually wrote to the world for once with he truly opened up and um i feel that that's what he did with this song uh that was our top 25 songs of the decade so far and you can actually listen to all these songs on our audio account which is uh you can find at the show notes in this post um we have like a embedded audio mosaic where every all these songs are in a playlist T- from uh, 25 to 1 and you can listen to it there so it's rdo.com slash people slash live and limbo follow us there and you can also see um, album and song reviews that andreas has written and i have uh, put them into the review sections of pretty much all the albums that we've and songs that we've talked about the only song that you won't oh, hear you. on this is uh my bloody valentine because it's not on rdo <laughs> <We're not. laughs> which usually we have a few missing so just one missing that's okay yeah, that's but okay. um i do recommend checking it out on youtube the band themselves have uploaded the song so um it's obviously not going to have the same sound quality but uh you can listen to it legally on youtube like the band themselves have uploaded oh, okay. it so that's good um where can all of our listeners yeah. find you well you can find me on twitter at andreas babs you can find myself on Twitter at Sean Chin. You can follow the show at Live in Limbo and use the hashtag Capsule Podcast to join in on the conversation. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes and now on RDO, as I mentioned, rdo.com slash people slash Live in Limbo. Follow us on there and we'll be shooting out playlists and all that good stuff and reviews. And 
You can always find the show notes at liveandlambo.com slash capsule. Stay tuned for our top 25 albums of the decade so far. Have a good one.